Chinese equity markets have been in the news recently because of some very sharp sell-offs. So in this video, we're going to look at the reasons behind that, but also whether it's likely to cause a contagion into markets more generally, and also what you should do about it. What kind of Chinese funds should you buy in the light of recent developments? So let's look at the Chinese sell-off in a bit more detail. This wonderful visualization from Finviz shows you the three-month returns for the largest stocks in the world outside the US. You can see that stocks are grouped by region and the size of the blocks represents the size of the company in terms of market capitalization. And beside me here you can see China, which really stands out because most of the stocks are in red. Alibaba, for example, has suffered a 13% fall in its equity price over this three-month period. So while this has been an awful time for Chinese stocks, you can see that it hasn't spread to other countries across the world yet. Now, the damage hasn't been equal across all Chinese sectors. It does seem to be concentrated on Chinese internet companies. The blue line is Chinese A shares. These are Chinese companies which trade on Chinese exchanges in Chinese currency. And that index so far hasn't suffered a big fall. In contrast, the red line is Chinese internet stocks. And those are clearly in a much more precarious position. In the first place, these stocks rallied a lot more after the pandemic sell-off in 2020, but now they've given up almost all of their gains and they're roughly where they were at the beginning of 2020. And if we look at non-US companies which have listed on US exchanges to get capital, you can see that China comes bottom of the list by quite a long way. The question on many people's minds is whether China will drag down other equity markets. And so far, at least, there doesn't seem to be any effect on the US market. So the S&P 500 is above me in blue, and the red line is the Shanghai SSE Composite Index. But as you can see, the SSE Composite hasn't really fallen much yet. And the SSE Composite is certainly a very volatile index. So there was an incredible rally in 2015 in that index, but that was followed by a series of sharp sell-offs in 2015 and 2016. Above me is the 2015 sell-off, and you can see there was a very clear effect on the US market during that sell-off. At the time, people were worried about Chinese growth, but also whether China was brewing its own version of a global financial crisis with a big credit bubble. Then there was another wobble in the Chinese equity market at the beginning of 2016, and that also spilled over into the US market. But the other thing to note here is that wasn't a huge sell-off. For the US, that peak to trough fall in 2016 was only about 12%, so it's really just little more than a correction. It's not even a bear market, which would be a 20% fall. So even if this does spill over into the US equity market and other markets globally, I don't think it's likely to be a full-on route. The root cause of this sell-off has been policy changes from the Chinese government, and that in turn has been driven by concerns about Chinese demographics. This graph goes back to 1960, and it shows you the dependency ratio for three countries, the UK, the US, and China. And the dependency ratio is the percentage of old people as a fraction of the working population. Now, it's a worry for any government if this dependency ratio becomes too high, because ultimately the health of an economy depends on people being productive, and younger working people tend to contribute more towards GDP. Now, it's a well-known fact that in developed markets, our population is aging. Our dependency ratios are gradually increasing. So in the UK, currently it's at about 30% and rising, and in the US, it's about 26% and rising. What's more surprising is the sign of China's dependency ratio, which is currently 17%, but it's rising rapidly. Now, that's going to have an impact on GDP growth, which is usually around 6% for China, but it's likely to push down that growth rate to levels which are closer to those of developed markets. And recent data published by the National Bureau of Statistics in China show that the birth rate is dropping quite sharply in China. And there's reason to suspect that the population data may have been overstated for some period of time. Part of the problem is that the budget distributed to regions by the central government depends on their population. So there's a clear incentive to overstate your region's population. But even China's central bank in a recent report said that we must realize that China's demographic picture has reversed. So it's no coincidence that many of these policies which we're about to discuss 
favour the ability of Chinese people to have larger families. Now, the inspiration for this video came from one of our Sunday evening calls. This screenshot is me talking on that call. And as a Patreon member, you get access to lots of members-only videos, plus you get access to Slack, so you can ask me questions anytime you like, or ask other members of the community questions. To learn more about how to sign up for that, just click on the link above me or the link in the description. I think the most shocking equity market falls in China have been in the education sector. These are three education companies based in China, but which have also listed on US stock exchanges. And some of those stocks have lost almost 60% of their value over a short period of time. And the reason for those falls is quite shocking, which is that the Chinese government says it's not ethical for companies to profit in this sector. And make no mistake, this is now government policy. The Chinese Communist Party and the State Council have both made statements about this sector. And what they've said is that the core parts of these businesses must be run on a non-profit basis. So the real question for me is why the share price isn't zero for those companies. And what's even more worrying is that those companies are no longer allowed to list on foreign exchanges. Now, foreign investors usually buy these stocks through something called a VIE, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if one sector's VIEs are banned, then investors in other sectors would also be worried that they won't be able to buy Chinese stocks directly. Another child-related development is in gaming. Another stock that's seen a big sell-off recently is Tencent, and this company generated 30% of its revenue through the gaming industry in Q1 this year. And there was a story that recently came out in Chinese state media, which was quickly deleted, which described gaming as spiritual opium. Now, that's very emotive in China, of course, because of the history of what happened during the Opium Wars, which was seen as a way for Western countries to subjugate the Chinese people. One of Tencent's most popular games is Honor of Kings, and it's banned any children below 12 years of age from spending money in the game, and it's restricted the time that children can spend playing the game. So it's just one hour a day on non-holidays, and just two hours a day on holidays. But at least the Chinese government stopped short of saying that companies can't profit from gaming. That would have been much more catastrophic for Tencent and other gaming companies in China. So equity markets have fallen in China, should we buy the dip? That certainly seems to be what's happening so far. If we look at the inflows into KWeb, which is the Chinese internet ETF, it's seeing record amounts of money flow into the fund. So it's kind of unusual to see a fund that's fallen in value by 33%, and yet at the same time the fund has taken in $3.5 billion. So clearly people so far are seeing this as an opportunity to buy into Chinese equity. Another question is what kind of Chinese exposure you should buy. Now, over the last decade, companies which are owned by the government, or state-owned enterprises as they're called, have underperformed companies which aren't. And in fact, Wisdom Tree, the fund manager, created an entire XSOE fund with ticker CXSE, which shuns those state-owned companies. And if you look at its returns from 2007 to 2020, you can see it's outperformed the broad market quite consistently. And the explanation for that from Wisdom Tree is that state-owned enterprises appeal more to government wishes than generating maximum return for shareholders. However, if you want to buy companies which are in line with the government's wishes, maybe you do want to go for state-owned enterprises. And if we look at the outperformance of CXSE compared to the broad Chinese market up to about 2018, it was consistently outperforming. But since then, and in particular in Q3, you can see that the bars turn red. That means that CXSE is underperforming the broad Chinese market. And part of the reason for that is that state-owned enterprises are outperforming. So certainly now I'd be considering buying the MSCI A shares trackers, or perhaps this will inspire Wisdom Tree to create an SOE only index. But I think what I'd definitely be avoiding right now is buying Chinese stocks indirectly on US exchanges. And this happens via variable interest entities, or VIEs. So let's say you're a US investor and you want to buy Alibaba stock. You can't do that directly on a Chinese exchange. But what you can buy is an American depository share, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And as it says in the description here, 
Each of those represents eight ordinary shares of Alibaba, but the linkage between the two entities is not direct. Now, what you're actually buying is a share of a holding company which is registered in the Cayman Islands, and that's Alibaba Group Holding Limited. And the share price of that company is indirectly linked to Alibaba in China via a series of legal agreements. If you want to read about all the risks you're taking with an ADS, you can do that in this Form F1 registration statement from the SEC. But as you can see, it refers to Alibaba Group Holding Limited, which is registered in the Cayman Islands. Now, when you buy a regular share, you legally own part of the company. That's what the word share means. But that's not the case with a variable interest entity. The link between the Chinese share price of Alibaba and the price on the New York Stock Exchange is via these dashed lines. And that ultimately depends on contractual arrangements which depend on Chinese law. Why do we have to go through such a complicated structure? Well, it's because China doesn't let foreigners buy shares of certain key sectors. And that prohibition applies to telco companies like Alibaba. So VIEs get around this by ensuring that the actual owners of the VIE are Chinese citizens. And in the case of Alibaba, that's Jack Ma and Simon Shi. And there's an amusing understatement in the F1 registration, which says these arrangements may not be as effective in providing operational control as direct ownership, i.e. by buying a stock. But I think The Economist summed it up very well in a recent article, where it said that it's not clear if this VIE structure is even legal under Chinese law. They say that Chinese courts have set few reliable precedents on VIEs, and the official position is one of toleration rather than approval. And of course, that toleration may end at any time. So to summarise, the sell-off so far has been concentrated in certain Chinese sectors, the ones which have fallen foul of government policy. It hasn't spread to the broader Chinese market or to global equity markets. And even if it did, that would just be a 10 to 20% fall, which would be a good buying opportunity. Now, if you do want to support us, remember you can always subscribe to our channel and that way you'll never miss another one of our videos or you could like this video. And as always, thank you for listening.